welcome, folks, to this special edition of the 700 Club. Today, you'll take control of this program from Riverside, California, to Dayton, Ohio, from Wausau, Wisconsin, to St. Petersburg, Florida, plus dozens of cities in between. You called and left your voicemail questions. And coming up, you're going to hear your voices on the air and answer your questions live. Whew. But first, let's take a look at the news. The food we eat, the cars we drive, the gas we buy, prices are going up, up, up. So what will this so-called Biden inflation mean for the midterm elections? CBN's White House correspondent Eric Phillips has the explanation. Prices on just about everything are soaring and consumer patience is waning as Americans deal with increased inflation while the economy makes a comeback from the pandemic. The White House promising prices will level off. The question, how long will that take? And will Republicans in the meantime be able to ride what some in the GOP are calling Biden inflation to a midterm election victory? You can't miss it. Americans are paying more for the food they eat, the cars they drive, and the gas that fuels them. Republicans are pointing the finger of blame at Democrats who are in majority power, especially the chief Democrat, President Biden. These continue to cause crises for every American family. Gas prices are up 45.1%. Used cars and trucks are up 45.2%. Fruit at the grocery store is up 7.3%. Milk is up 5.6%. The president insisting the increases are temporary. Economists call all these things transitory effects. And they account for about 60% of the price increases we've seen over the last few months. But even if that's true, people across all socioeconomic lines are still feeling the pinch right now. According to a recently released Fox News poll, 83% of respondents are concerned about inflation. We did notice the dairy stuff is going up. I'll actually spend, you know, maybe 20% more, 10% more. The cost of produce has gone up, especially like we shop at Whole Foods and anything organic is expensive. A separate poll being released by Republican nonprofit American Action Network indicates 88% of voters say they are worried about the rising cost of living, 73% about possible tax increases. And Joe Biden, by the way, promised he wouldn't raise taxes on hardworking families. And yet he already has because inflation hits the lowest income people the hardest. Republicans see an opportunity with the upcoming midterms because higher prices resonate with voters across all socioeconomic levels. Republicans hope it's their ticket to regaining power in Congress and maybe even convincing some to change political parties in light of what they call Biden runaway spending. Case in point, a $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation package to fund social programs ranging from child care to free college tuition to environmental initiatives. Regardless of where inflation stands when the 2022 elections roll around, the White House is hoping voters will remember its vaccination efforts, as well as the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which they say helped keep people afloat, even though the bill had no Republican support. At the White House, Eric Phillips, CBN News. Well, in other news, fireworks in Congress. Dr. Fauci and Senator Rand Paul go head to head. So what really happened in that Wuhan lab? Who's telling the truth and who's lying? John Jessup has more from CBN News. Pat, that fire exchange in Congress between Dr. Anthony Fauci and Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul centers on the controversy about whether COVID-19 originated in a lab in Wuhan, China, and if the NIH funded what's called gain-of-function research, which includes experiments to make the virus more transmissible. The evidence is pointing that it came from the lab, you, and there will be responsibility for those who funded the right. lab, including yourself. I totally This committee resent, will allow the witness to respond. I totally resent the lie that you are now propagating, Senator. And you are implying that what we did was responsible for the deaths of individual. I totally resent that. Could that. Have been. And if anybody is lying been. here, Senator, it is you. Senator Rand Paul later telling Fox News that he'll seek a criminal referral from the Justice Department because he believes Dr. Fauci 
lied to Congress. Well, Israel is pushing back against ice cream maker Ben & Jerry's decision to stop selling its products to Jewish communities in the West Bank and Eastern Jerusalem. The decision giving a boost to the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement aimed at isolating the Jewish state. Israel's ambassador is sending a letter to the governors of 35 U.S. states with anti-BDS laws asking them to enforce sanctions against companies that support the movement. In a statement, Ben & Jerry said it is inconsistent with its values to do business with what it called occupied Palestinian territory. But its parent company, Unilever, said the ice cream maker wanted to boycott all of Israel. A spokesman for the U.S. State Department did not comment on the company's action, but did affirm that the White House, quote, firmly rejects the BDS movement, which unfairly singles out Israel, end quote. Pat, back to you. Well, I'm just not going to buy Ben and Jerry's. I'm not sure I have bought it up to date anyhow, but... Uh... Well, I'd have, and I really am kind of sad, but... You know, they don't know that scripture, Pat, that says it, those who bless Israel shall be blessed. Right. Those who curse Israel be shall cursed. be cursed. That is not going to be good business. They're very popular and they're very good, but you don't mess with Israel. The Yale faculty has just done the same thing. They've boycotted Israel. I mean, you know, let's face it, that, that we, we showed on this program the training of young uh, Palestinians to kill Israelis. The whole idea of having a two-state solution is just a chimera. It will not happen. Welcome to this special edition of Your Voicemail Questions and Pat's Honest Answers. We're going to start with this caller, Sheila, from Center, Alabama. Here's Sheila. My question is, if there is success in cloning human beings, what is your opinion on them actually having a soul? Thank you. I hope and pray that we never get to the point where we clone humans. We cloned a sheep. We've cloned other uh, animals. We've actually, uh, I noticed they were cloning polo ponies. But uh, human beings, I, I don't think that it's too monstrous even to consider. And, you know, so I, I don't want to just whether, the, whether the, a clone will have a soul. I, I just don't think it should be done. It's, it's a monstrosity that should be stopped by the government. I, I don't think that any responsible a medical person will get involved in that. Let's right. hope not. Well, here's Steve from Hanover, Pennsylvania, with this question for Pat. I had two questions. One, does God sleep? And two, does God ever get sick? <laughs> the, he who watches over Israel, the Bible says, neither slumbers nor sleeps. No, the God is eternally vigilant, and no, he doesn't sleep. <laughs> nor does he get sick. No, he certainly doesn't get <laughs> sick. All right. All right, here's a question. Sharon from Centrala, Illinois, with this one. We've supported your ministry since the 70s and watch you every day. Thank God for you. Here's my question. If our sins and we ask for forgiveness are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, how is it we're judged for every idle word or unproductive word? Thank you. God bless. Or uh, the sins are forgetting. God doesn't hold us accountable for a sin, but we will all appear before the judgment seat, the beam of Christ, to account for what we did in our bodies. So, are you doing good works? Are you cheating people and stuff like that? I mean, how has your life been lived? And there, there will be rewards. I just can't believe that when we stand before God that everybody's going to get the same deal. I mean, if somebody's worked hard all their lives serving God, uh, the th thought that he would get the same thing as somebody who laid around and didn't do anything. So, but th that isn't the same thing as sin. God's not going to hold us accountable necessarily for sin. But we are going to give account for what we've done in our bodies. So the life we live is going to be, there'll be some accountability at the last judgment. The Bible says that. Mm. Okay. Amen. Here's Paula from Tampa, Florida, with another question for Pat. When the Lord raises the dead in Christ and he takes the living believers up with him, do we come down then later when he establishes his rule on earth? Thank you. Enjoy your program. Uh, the Bible says he'll descend with a shout of command, with the trumpet of God, and at the last trump, uh, will those who are dead will rise, and those of us who are alive will be will be uh, transformed in a twinkling of an eye, a twinkle as fast as it could be, and we will be transformed. 
At that point, we will live and reign with Jesus Christ. We'll, have, we'll be like him because we'll, we'll see him as he is. So uh, uh, the question is, when he comes back again, the saints of God will, of course, be with him, and we'll be part of that heavenly kingdom that will we'll reign and rule with Christ forever and ever and ever. All right? Amen. Well, here's Miguel from Riverside, California. When you write a book, what is your protocol? What are the steps that you take when you first write a book from beginning to end? Thank you. You know, I just kind of like to ask the Lord. I and mean, when I, I've written and finished a book on the Holy Spirit, and I just said, Lord, you lead me. And then it's amazing, just day after day after day, it would come to me, and I would write, write down the chapter, and then I'd wait until the next day, and I'd get another one. Uh, when I wrote the book, I Walk with the Living God, I did have a sort of a timeline of stuff that had happened because I, you, you, you don't remember everything you've done over the last 50 years. But from then on out, I, 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 it would just come. I would just sit there and, and in the morning, and God would just give it to me. I, I don't know what to say. I, I, I wish I could say I was more systematic, but I'm really not. But the books come out pretty good when I get through. And you just, you have to take the time to do it. You have to sit down, put your hands on the keyboard or however you do it, or I think you used well, a pad, I, writing I used, pad. I used to write everything out longhand. Yeah. Uh, these last couple, I, 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 I've dictated them. So I'm going to sit there and it just comes. But I mean, I, I, I'm thinking, praying, and then the Lord just kind of gives it to me and then it begins to flow out. Well, you've I, written some incredible books. Amen. Lost count how many. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got about 23 now. Oh, man. All That's... right. Okay, our next question comes from Joan. She's from Coventry, Rhode Island. What can I do to help myself become more faithful? I try to pray every day, and yet sometimes I just feel like I'm not getting there. Any information you can give me would be helpful. Thank you, Pat. Joan, I recommend the thing is to empty yourself. The Bible says he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and so forth. I think the biggest thing is to stop struggling. You know, we try to be good. We try to do this. We And, you know, our works are not going to save us. Uh, we're saved by grace, and that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. So I think the thing that we need to do is to open our hearts and say, God, we praise you and worship you, and we receive your blessing. And he will hear and give it to you. You know, I'm thinking about Adam who walked in the garden with God in, in the cool of the evening, and it was if it was effortless, that relationship was effortless. Exactly. I mean, they that are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God, and that's the way it works. All right, Don? All right, good question. Uh, Don from Houston, Texas, with this question for Pat. I would like to know, do you have to be baptized in order to be saved? Um, no, you don't. The Apostle Paul said, look, I didn't baptize any. He said, oh, yeah, there was a the little household of Stephanus and this and that. But he said, God didn't send me to baptize but to preach the gospel. So if baptism was salvation, Paul would have had to baptize everybody. Mm -hmm. Baptism is a sign of obedience after you have come to the Lord. And you're buried with him and raised in newness of life. But it, it is... It is a sign that you have died to yourself and have been raised in newness of life, but it's after you're saved. It, it does not, your salvation does not in, pertain to your baptism, in my opinion. Amen. All right, Sarah from Durham, North Carolina, with this question. Pat, you have addressed electric cars favorably. How will charging stations challenge the electrical grid. Yeah. Oh. I really don't have all that, but I tell you, um, we're going to have them. And the thing that over in, in, in Europe, Volkswagen uh, is going to try to set up charging stations on, on its own. It will not have government support. And um, they, I don't think that's going to uh, impact the, the grid particularly. I, I don't know enough about it to say but I, I do think that these electric cars are so much superior to the uh, internal combustion engine. There's no comparison. No comparison in the price, no comparison in the excellence of them. 
and uh, I'm surprised they haven't taken hold as fast as they any fast. Tesla has done very well with theirs, but uh, uh, you, you have Neo and several of them in China, but we 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 don't have enough of them. I think GM is starting to put out uh, electric trucks, but the charging stations I don't think it's going to affect the grid. I, I really can't say, but it. Uh, it, it won't do any more to it than what's done now. And one thing, you won't be burning fossil fuels with electric cars. Right. What's going to happen to the gasoline industry? Well, it's tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Well, we're not there yet, though. So, <laughs> Okay, another question from Oliver from Wausau, Wausau, Wisconsin. Dr. Robertson, in light of your teaching about a post-tribulation rapture, how do you understand the scripture in First Thessalonians chapter 4 talking about the fact that we are not appointed unto wrath? Thanks very much for taking my question and for your answer. I'm not sure that that one you're referring to, that we're not appointed unto wrath, that, that's got, uh, I really believe that the, the whole idea of, of that it was, expounded by John Nelson, Nelson Darby and picked up by Schofield. There's going to be this seven-year period in between and that there'll be a secret catching away and so forth. Uh, I don't think tribulation is the kind of wrath that God's talking about. The world is going to be given uh, a period of, of suffering. And the Bible says immediately after the tribulation of those days. So we're, we're not appointed under wrath, but we are not going to be given the wrath of God. That is in the wrath of God. And those of us who know the Lord, but we may have to go through this thing. You know, look at the Church of Philadelphia. Because you've kept the word of my patience, therefore I've kept you from the hour of trial that will come upon the whole earth. So uh, I've, God knows how to take care of his people, but there has been suffering. You, you can't lose the fact that over the years, Christians have had suffering. And Jesus said, "You will in, in the world. You'll, uh, Paul said, you, in the world you'll have many tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world." Amen. Uh, okay. I mean, you think about the, Ro the Christians that lived during the Roman Empire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you go, they, there were at least ten specific persecution of Christians. Yeah. So, uh, you know, okay. All right. Here's Linda from Gulfport, Mississippi. I guess what I don't really understand is the difference between predestined and Destin. Could you explain that for me? Well, I don't, I don't know. But predestined and Destin is just, it's just two sides of the same coin. What we're talking about is predestination is whether God knows in advance what's going to happen to you or doesn't. Mm -hmm. And I have said, I, I, I learned in seminary, it's like a, a, a twist between two things. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, quote, for it is God that works in you, both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So, in a sense, God, you know, I said it's like you've got two basketball teams. One uh, is in charge of the action, but the score is on the other team, which the invisible team. Mm. And so, God is, is looking after you, and, and yet at the same time, uh, you are to work out your own salvation with fear, fear and trembling, okay? Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The former Washington State High School football coach fired over post-game prayers is headed back to the Supreme Court. The Ninth Circuit Court, uh, Court of Appeals ruled in favor of his former employer, the Bremerton School District, this week. The Supreme Court sent the case back to the lower courts in 2019, saying more facts were needed. Joe Kennedy and his lawyers say the district's order to end his on-field post-game prayers violated his First Amendment rights, and they'll continue to fight. Well, the Biden administration is ready to approve a controversial natural gas pipeline running from Russia to Germany. Officials say the agreement could be released as soon as today. The past two administrations opposed the Nord Stream 2 pipeline because it increases Russia's economic and political power throughout Europe. Critics say European nations could get hooked on Russia's natural gas, leaving them vulnerable to blackmail if the Kremlin threatens to restrict or cut off the flow.
Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. And welcome back to the special edition of the 700 Club, your voicemail questions and Pat's honest answers. Let's get started with Walter. He's from Dayton, Ohio. Here's Walter. I am 49 years old and I live in Dayton, Ohio, and I have Down syndrome. So my question to Pat is, when I die and go to heaven, will I still have Down syndrome? Thank you. Walter, God bless you. You have Down syndrome. When you get to heaven, you're going to have a body like Jesus. You will look like him. You'll be f fresh and you'll be new and you'll be absolutely whole. You'll be a spiritual being <clears throat> and you will not be subject to any of the diseases that come about. There'll be no more tears, no more sorrow, and no disease in heaven. All right. God bless him. Oh, great question. Here's Sylvia from Arlington, Texas. <clears throat> My question is, it says that when God banned Cain, Cain went off and married. My question is, who did he marry if they were the only ones on the earth? The Bible isn't clear about that, but I'm sure that Adam and Eve had other children. Uh, we, we learn about Cain and Abel, but they must have had others. And so uh, if they were the only people, that meant that they were, there was no law against incest in those early days because it was the only family that was there. So he must have had some sisters, and he must have gotten married to those sisters. I mean, something had to be done to propagate the race, and there were only two of them. And so we, about seven billion people, and they had to come from somewhere. So I, I think that's the only way we can read it is Adam and Eve must have had other children, some of whom were girls. All right. That's the best explanation I've heard. And <laughs> the fact that, like you said, uh, incest was not illegal or taboo then. Well, it couldn't the, the be. The big thing about incest that's so bad is inbreeding. When you have genetic problems and yeah. you have two people of the same uh, family joining together, those recessive genes will be magnified and you'll have all kinds of problems. But in those days, they were right. completely pure and everything was fine. All right, all next right. question. Great answer. Here's Vivian uh, from Reading, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. My friend Kathy and myself, we were wondering, are there layers of hell? She thought she heard about seven layers of hell. Are there? I watch you every day and enjoy it. Thanks, Vivian. I, I believe that the Apostle Paul talked about being caught up into uh, a higher level of paradise. As far as hell, it's just going to be one big lake of fire, and it'll be it'll be horrible. It'll be forever and ever, and uh, the worm doesn't die, and the fire isn't quenched. It's just going to be awful. But I, I don't think he. I mean, how many layers of pain can you take? I mean, it's going to be so awful. You can't have any additional layers to it. There are different layers of heaven, however, according to the Apostle Paul. Gary? Because he was in the third. Third, third, the third heaven. Third heaven. That's right. All right. We have this question from Gary, and he's from Michigan. Uh, a while back, I heard you say on the show that you believe that an asteroid hit planet Earth that wiped out all the dinosaurs. I would like to know if you have any scripture to back up that belief. Thank you. The scripture doesn't go back 250 million years ago or 30 million or whatever it was. Uh, there was something happened that changed the climate and knocked the earth off its course. And the only explanation is, of course, it looks like initially what was is now Mars and the Earth banged together, and out of that came a moon, which we needed. Mm -hmm. God set the whole thing up, but uh, I, I don't have anything in the, in the Scripture to back that that up because it's we don't have anything in the Scripture about dinosaurs and all these prehistoric beings. Just Leviathan, that's it. Well, the, the, the Leviathan was the whale, and you know <laughs> <laughs> we have whales and we have we have. Um, hippopotamuses and things like that, but, but uh, the, do I have any scripture? No, I don't. I, the, the, that's just science, sir. I'm just glad the dinosaurs were long gone before <laughs> we got here. All right, here's Laura from Baltimore, Maryland. I had a financial question for Pat. I was wondering if he could share the best way for us to invest our money and keep our money safe. I appreciate your wisdom and knowledge on this, Pat. Love the 700 Club. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, 
I, I really believe the best investment is to find solid companies that uh, have been around a while and that pay regular dividends. And, uh, you know, beyond that, uh, I, I think gold will go up and down, silver will go up and down. And um, the Bible says, neither their silver or gold will deliver them the day of God's wrath. So I, I, I just believe that, um, you know, the, the American dollar may be depreciating in value, but I think well-managed companies that have been around a long while that are paying regular dividends at this point in time is the best uh, investment. And I know uh, the Oracle of Omaha has said that he recommends people invest in index funds. I don't know. But that, that, that's, that's what I would recommend is find companies that are solid. They, you know, they've got a repeat business. They've got a franchise where they, they have a, a, a monopoly on what they're doing and they pay regular dividends. Okay. And something my dad talked to me about recently, Pat, um, as you get to be older and closer to retirement, uh, you don't want to be so heavily invested in stocks, do you? No, I, I don't agree with that. I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up to my eyeballs, and I'm heavy in the stocks. I, I, I think it, it doesn't matter, you know, but I, I found some stocks that pay very solid. One's paying 10% dividends. Another one has been paying every day, year. It just pays on and on and on. It's the right stocks with the, the dividends. Right, the right, well, that's right. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. All right, here's Michelle from Chesterfield, South Carolina. When we go to heaven, are we able to look down and see what our loved ones on earth are doing? Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I don't believe that's the case. I, I, I know that uh, the, the story of Dives and Lazarus uh, and uh, uh, the rich man was being tormented and he said, look, I've got brothers and sisters in, 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 in on earth and and I don't want them to get tormented. And um, Abraham said, there's a great gulf between you and me, and they can't go from here to there, and you can't go from there back up. I, I don't believe that our loved ones are looking in on us. I just don't believe the Bible teaches that. All right, next. Here's Eddie, Salisbury, North Carolina, with this question for Pat. Hi, Pat. What's the difference between the Grim Reaper and the Angel of Death? I think they're the same. The Grim Reaper is not a biblical term. No. That's just that's just uh, uh, the name that the popular culture has given to death. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know that there's an angel of death either. I, I just think that, you know, when we die, it depends on whether we're in the Lord or not. And, you know, the Bible talks about Jesus sending his angels to take his, his, his elect to the, you know, so forth. Any, all right. Okay, great question. Here's Misty from Spindale, North Carolina. My question is, I have a lot going on in my life, and I find it so difficult to find time to pray. And I just wonder if the Holy Spirit prays on my behalf when I'm overwhelmed and can't seem to get it together enough to, to go to the Lord. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Uh, Miss, you're exactly right. The Bible says the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings which cannot be uttered. But I, I tell you what, you know, if you're if that filled with the Holy Spirit, to pray in the Spirit, you can, you know, you can pray without ceasing. You know, there was a book long time ago, a guy named Brother Lawrence, he wrote a book called Practice in the Presence of God. His job was to wash the dishes. And so when he was washing dishes, he's praising God. Mm -hmm. And you can praise God wherever you are. You don't have to have a church. You don't have to have a quiet place. Having a quiet place is really good. But at the same time, you can pray without ceasing. And as you're walking along, you're praying. As you're thinking of God, you're praying. As you're talking to the Lord, he's talking to you. That's the way it ought to be. Sure. Good word. Okay, here's Cheryl from Livermore, California. Hi, Pat. May we please hear a story about you and your favorite dog? <laughs> well, I, I have had several. Um, I, I guess, uh, well, I, I've had uh, Borzois and I've had uh, uh, everything, every kind of poodle from uh, little toys to standards. I've had a, a 
Well, I, I, I think when I was growing up, <clears throat> I had a cocker spaniel, and he was the cutest little dog, and I named him Loki, which is after the god of mischief. And he, he was such a wonderful little dog. When I was growing up, he was so special. Aww. But I, 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 I train dogs. I've, I've, I've had a couple of Dobermans. I had one uh, that I had uh, when I was in law school, and man, he was a fantastic animal. He. He loved me, and I loved him, and we're very close. And so, Aww. You know. how did you do law school and have a dog and take care of a dog? Well, I, I lived off campus. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what happened to Princess Maggie? Uh, Princess Maggie uh, was hit by a car, so... and the car not only hit her but rolled back over top of her and broke oh, her spine, and we had to put her down. She used to come on the show quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. She was trained, but I, I, I train dogs and horses, and it's fun. I mean, they. They're, they're just great animals and great companions. Yeah, I tried to, I tried to teach them to learn language so that they would understand what I was talking about. But anyhow, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of pets. And, but again, my favorite dog was that little little cocker spaniel years ago when wow. I was a kid. Oh man, great stories. All right, here's Chip from Knoxville, Tennessee, with another question for Pat. Hi, Pat. In the past, you've had astrophysicist Hugh Ross on your program. And you both said that the world is more than 4 billion years old. In Mark 10, 6, Jesus said, referring to Adam and Eve, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. So does this mean that man has been here for more than 4 billion years? Please explain. Thank you. Chef, I, I don't think so. I think man as we know him, uh, is it 50,000, is it 10,000, 20,000? Well, what is called Homo sapiens has been here just a short time. The world, the, the formation of the universe, and we're talking about the entire universe uh, is maybe four billion years old. I mean, the, I mean, you know, there was a big bang and then you have to get the planets and then all this stuff is gas and it has to cool down and it took forever. So that's what we're talking about. Were there cavemen though with the dinosaurs? Well. <laughs> there, there are Neanderthals and various people along the way that have have had, uh, but the question is, are they really the same as the uh, Homo sapiens that we know right now or not? Mm. Uh, but in terms of caveman, I don't know about a caveman. The Bible doesn't say about a caveman. I don't know about a caveman. But uh, I do know that there have been various layers. But we, we, what we have right now are what are called Homo sapiens, and I don't think that we have, the Adam and Eve progeny have been around on Earth very long, but in terms of the universe, the creation since the very beginning of time, when it was the Big Bang, was at least four billion years, because it took that long to get everything in, in, in space, get it all set up. It took a long time to cool this Earth. It took a long time to break through it have us a moon, to have the or oceans. To, I mean, the processes are just incredible. They take a long, long time. It's a whole lot longer today, 6,000 years, believe me. Well, we are going to jump back into our third round of your voicemail questions. And here's a viewer from Bakersfield, California. Go ahead. Hello, Pat. Can you please talk about where the idea came from regarding praying to saints, angels, virgins, prophets, apostles, etc., for healing and forgiveness and other life issues. Thank you, Pat. Um, I think the Bible makes it clear we're not supposed to pray to anybody except to God himself uh, in the Holy Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. But the idea of praying to saints, I think it, it came about the thought that, look, if you really wanted to get to somebody, why don't you talk to his mother? Uh, and so the Virgin Mary uh, came to be honored in, in, uh, in, in one particular uh, ecclesiastical uh, 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 denomination. Uh, but I, I, the idea of praying to saints, you know, Saint Jude and Saint this and Saint the other, there's nothing in the Bible that says we should pray to Saint Paul or Saint Peter or Saint anybody else. And uh, I, 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 th I think we, we uh, you know, the Bible says we should call no man father. I mean, we have one father who's God. And I, I think the idea of honoring some saint and 
Uh, but the, 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 the pagans used to pray the stars. They worshiped the sun and the moon and the various stars, and so it's easy to translate that into into say, well, we'll call uh, that star, we'll call him uh, Neptune, and we'll pray to St. Neptune, and then we'll call this one Jude, and we'll pray to St. Jude. I don't know where it came from. It's been there for a long time, but it's, it's pagan in, in, in origin, in my opinion. All right. All right, good word. Here's Anne from Nishua, New Hampshire, with this question for Pat. Pat, could you please tell me how long you've been working out on the total gym? And is it really easy for senior citizens and easy to set up and take down when you don't have the room to keep it up afterward after exercising? Thank you so much. Great fan of the total gym. I've been working on one for years. I mean, I don't know exactly how many years, but I, I use it uh, dramatically, and I just bought a new one. Uh, the, the, they, they have various prices, and the, the cheap ones are not really worth the money, but I think the other ones are very good. And uh, But it is an incredible. You can do 70 different exercises on one of them, and, and yes, you can take them down and put them up. But, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're great devices. I mean, whoever came up with it was a genius. <laughs> but 70 exercises at least, and they are wonderful machines. Didn't Chuck Norris, uh, wasn't Chuck Norris a spokesperson well, yeah, for Total Gym? Ch Ch Chuck has been showing how to do it over <laughs> the years. But I mean, I, I do all kinds of things. I, you can do uh, push-ups, you can do over-the-shoulder things, you can do um, bicep curls, you name it, you can do it on the Total Gym. They're, they're great devices, all right? Awesome. Okay, here's Bill from Goldsboro, North Carolina, with this question. I would like to ask you a question about angels. I just wonder, when were angels created? I appreciate the answer. God bless. Um, I think the angels were created shortly thereafter the uh, creation of the world. You know, the, the Satan was uh, the covering angel. You know, he was the anointed covering, uh, and that's the word cherub, was the one who covered the holiness of God. And he was with God in the early days. And so there was a rebellion against God in heaven, and he took, uh, Satan took a third of the so-called angels with him in that rebellion, and they have become demonic spirits. But uh, I think the angels, you know, <clears throat> you, you, you look at Job and others, you know, where were you when I created the earth, when, when the, the sons of God shouted for joy? So I, I think the angels were go a long, long way back. All right, our next question comes from Franklin, Virginia, and Deborah has the question. When we go to heaven, even though we've been forgiven for our sins, do we still have to answer to God when we make it to heaven? Uh, you know, the Lord said, he that hears my word, believes it that on him that sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come to judgment, but is passed from death into life. That's what the Bible said. So when, when you have been forgiven, your sins are forgiven. But I, as we said to a, in a previous question, I do believe that the Apostle Paul says that there will be rewards in heaven. And um, we talk about he that knew that the, the Lord's will uh, and, and did it will be rewarded. And he that knew the Lord's will and didn't do it, he will be punished with many stripes and so forth. So I do think that there, there are enough verses in the Bible to indicate that there's going to be some level of accountability when we get to heaven. I, I just don't think everybody's going to go home free. And uh, you, you really think it's only fair uh, if somebody spent a lifetime serving God and working for Him and doing things, that he or she would get the same deal as somebody who, who totally ignored the Lord and said, well, I'm saved and I, I'm going to go to church once a week and I'm, I'm a pew sitter. So anyhow, yeah. so much for that. Let's go somewhere. All right. The, the goal is to get in, though. <laughs> right. I think, you know, Paul said, this one thing I do that I may attain the resurrection of the dead. That's what we want to do, is get to heaven. That's, yeah. that's the big thing, Amen. regardless of what the other are. Here's Jerry, Bradford, Pennsylvania, with this question for Pat. I just wanted to know, what single supplement would you say is the most important thing 
for your good mentality at your age. Thank you so much. I, I think, uh, you know, that gut floor thing, we sent out a book about the butt. Apparently, the vagus nerve connects your stomach to your brain, and your mood will be affected by this whole gut flora. And so looking after the little critters, and there are billions of them in your, in your intestines, that it will affect your mood. And so in my opinion, the big thing is to avoid uh, artificial sweeteners, mm -hmm. to avoid uh, any kind of antibiotics that will kill them dead, and to make sure that you eat, don't eat sweets and white flour and that kind of thing, but to eat fruits and vegetables and natural stuff, and especially some bran along the way because the little critters need some feeding. So um, I, I think the we put a little book about how to have a better gut, and I, I, I do think that that will affect your mental health, and it's also about uh, at least 80% of your immune system is there in that gut flora. So it's amazing what God has set up down there, and these little critters are down there doing good for you if you don't mess them up. So, so stay, away, stay away from artificial sweeteners and stay away particularly, if you possibly can, from antibiotics. All right. Shanice from St. Petersburg, Florida. Go ahead with this question. What does the word mean when it says to meditate day and night? Does it mean to think about the word throughout the day or speak the word? Thank you. Well, Shanice, meditate means just what it says. You think about it. Uh, uh, it doesn't hurt to talk about it, but uh, uh, you, you, I think the idea is you're thinking on the word, how will a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might sin against, might not sin against thee. So we have our, the word built up and we meditate on it. You think about the Psalms, you think about the good things of God, you think about the book of Romans, all those things. And to meditate is to just what it says. You think about them, okay? Here's Sherry from Anaheim, California. I was wondering if you're supposed to leave an inheritance to your children and your grandchildren if they don't want anything to do with you. Thank you. Uh, Sherry, I, you're not under the ob obligation to give to uh, ingrates. The last thing you want to do is to enrich somebody who's an ingrate. But uh, the, the, the righteous man heaps up for his children, uh, you know, but you don't heap them up for much of ingrates. Mm. So if I were you, I would pick some worthy uh, cause that you really believe in and leave your inheritance to them. Uh, but th th that's an individual decision. But no, you're not under any obligation to leave a lot of money to a bunch of ingrates, especially those who will waste your money when they get it, all right? Amen. All right, Steve, from Crawfordsville, Oregon, go ahead. How come there's no mention of dinosaurs in the Bible? Just curious. Thank you. Well, uh, because as I, we were talking earlier, uh, the dinosaurs were just not part of the experience uh, the Bible centers on the family of Abraham and, 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 and Isaac and Jacob and, and the revelation of God uh, and uh, a, a few verses leading up to that. But uh, it's, it's not a it's not a bio, it's not a it's not a book of biology. It's not a book of geology. Uh, it's a spiritual book. Period. All right. Next question. All right. That's a good answer. Here's a view a viewer from Atlanta, Georgia. Go ahead. Hi, Pat. What are your thoughts on the teachings of once saved, always saved, or you can lose your salvation? Thank you for your thoughts. God bless. I, I really believe that when we are adopted in the family of God, we can be a, a comfortable in the goodness of God, but at the same time to rely on some doctrine that once I'm saved, I'm always saved and I can do anything I want to. Uh, is wrong, and Paul said their judgment is just. So th th that's my feeling on it. You, you, you must continue in the Word. If you continue in the Word, if you continue to follow the Lord, that's what He wants you to do.
Well, these last words I say, walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. Thanks so much for your questions. For Wendy and all of us, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.